Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. These lyrics are the desire of our heart. We long to stand before you uh, with joy in the eternal state, and we count it a privilege to do that now. Here in this life, with all that you have for us, um, all of the difficulty or the trial, all of the challenges and the battle for sanctification, it continues. And yet here on the Lord's Day, we gather as, as your people and we, we have the privilege of just standing before you as your church, your people, to stand before you with joy, knowing that forgiveness is ours, knowing that, Father God, that your Son is our brother, our Lord, and our Savior. Knowing that you could do no wrong and that you are ministering to us in this church and through this church in profound ways, glorifying your name in profound ways that um, we could never have imagined. And so the joy is ours because you're getting glory for your name. And the joy is ours because we have a, a clean conscience to think that we can commemorate the death and burial and resurrection of your son benefiting from it in an eternal way, knowing that all of our sins, past, present, and future, have been wiped out, not by mere fiction, not by some sort of cosmic snapping of fingers and ignoring reality, but by satisfying your own wrath against your son. The, the, the wrath that was due to us that your son never deserved, that he took that wrath and satisfied it in his own soul on the cross on our behalf. And so this joy is ours. And so as we turn our attention to your word, Lord, it's just the profound joy and privilege that we get to listen as you speak. We get to hear your words. We get to benefit from it. And I pray that in a, as we pray every Lord's Day, that as we look at your word, your spirit would minister in profound ways to each and every one of us here. And I would even pray on the front end of this text, Lord, that whether that's a soul who is hearing truth for the first time or whether that's somebody who's very familiar with truth but maybe still does not know you or whether that's your own true child, I pray that your spirit would apply it in a very direct and personal way so that you would receive the glory that you so richly deserve when your word is opened. In your name we pray, amen. Well, take your seat, and I want to ask you to grab your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 3. I want to begin with a trick question this morning. The trick question is, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? The obvious answer is yes, you all do. But the question is, what is that relationship? What does it consist of? Uh, everyone who is created has a relationship with Jesus Christ, but we talk about a relationship with Christ in so, such familiar terms that it can kind of become a little bit um, casual. We can almost become indifferent to the question and the significance of the question. It's uh, The younger generation right now is putting a virtue, a preeminent virtue in relationships on authenticity. And you've probably heard the discussion about authenticity. An authentic relationship is somebody that you can be authentic around. You can let your hair down, you can be casual, you can be informal. You can just let yourself show for all of your genuineness. It's, authenticity is kind of a synonym for genuineness. It's just um, authentic when you can be raw, you can be yourself, you can be who you are, and you are affirmed, that's allowed, and that's defended. And that's so different than if we use the term authentic in a, in a right and biblical sense of an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. An authentic relationship with Jesus Christ depends on acknowledging him for who he is genuinely. A relationship with Jesus Christ is worshiping him on, and taking him on his terms. He sets the terms of a true relationship. It's accepting him as a savior. It's worshiping him as Lord. He's the one who determines what an actual, authentic relationship really is. It's not determined by the sinner. It's not determined by us. 
Uh, we do not have the right to say that we have a good, authentic quality with relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ simply because we assert it to be true. It's not our right. It's not our prerogative. We don't have authority to say, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ and it's good simply because I say so. It can only be affirmed on the basis of Christ's authority and he determines what a true, authentic relationship really is. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus does not use the term authenticity. His phrase is a relationship, it's a family relationship. And I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you in Christ's family? That is a different question than do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Every human being who's ever lived has a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is their creator. He is their Lord, whether acknowledged or not. But this question is altogether different. This question is a question that every single individual, I beg you, must answer before this sermon is over. Are you in Christ's family? That is the question. As an individual, you have a relationship with Christ. He's your Lord, and we will all stand before him. We all must stand before him in judgment. We will all be judged on the last day, 2 Corinthians 5 says. But are you in his family? Let's pick it up in Mark chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 20 to 35. Mark chapter 3, verse 20 to 35, and I'm just going to read straight through this text, and you're going to notice that it's a story within a story. The first two verses are a story about Jesus' biological family. Verses 22 to 30 is a story about the scribes. And then in verse 31 to 35, Mark goes back and picks up the story about Christ's biological family. And that becomes important to understand what Mark is doing in this particular story, because it's a story within a story for a particular reason. Let's pick it up in verse 20. And he, Jesus, came home. And the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he has lost his senses. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he's possessed by Beelzebul, and he casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. And he called them to himself, and he began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one can enter into the strong man's house and Plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. The crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. As I mentioned, this is a story within a story. 
story in verse 22 to 30 is the story of the scribes. Notice in verse 22, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem, and it goes on to describe their accusation and their hostility to Jesus Christ. And that is sandwiched, and this is often called in commentaries a Markin sandwich. He's very fond of using sandwiches. He's very fond of making sandwiches, if you will. And he just kind of tells a story within a story, and the bookends of the story are, are really the critical element. And then the, the, the inside story that's surrounded by this other story is, is used as kind of a foil or a contrast or a comparison. It's, it's really a helpful instruction, a teaching tool, because what it does is it puts these two stories in contrast so you can make the comparison you're supposed to make. When I was... Um, uh, in, uh, young and unmarried and excited about proposing to uh, my, my, my current wife, April. Uh, not sure what she would say. If I asked her to marry me, I knew I needed to buy the right stone. And so I found a, a diamond vendor in the jewelry district of LA and, and uh, went to look at what he had. And uh, there I am, a you know, pretty, pretty poor seminary student. And uh, so what do you got for 12 bucks? And I uh, just you know, had a little bit more than 12 bucks. <laughs> But he, he pulls out some stones, and he starts, you know, it was interesting, you know, usually when you see stones, it's like against a black velvet backdrop. And it's interesting, if you put virtually any diamond I've ever seen in front of a black velvet backdrop, it looks amazing. He puts it in front of a white backdrop. He shows me one, I said, well, that's impressive. Don't even know what I'm looking at, an untrained eye, unprofessional, I just here to get a rock. I'm looking at this stone, yeah, it looks great. And then he pulls out a colorless diamond and puts it next to the one he just showed me that looked amazing. And against a white backdrop, the color of this diamond suddenly was amazing. And the one that formerly looked amazing looked really yellow. And it no longer looked so amazing. And that's kind of what Mark does with these stories within a story. This becomes quite common. He does it many, many, many times. We're going to see this throughout the Gospel of Mark. What he's doing here, though, is just incredibly fascinating. If you've been keeping with us through the series as we've studied this Gospel, um, I, I've mentioned that Mark really documents the unbelief of the religious leaders from chapter 2, verse 1, all the way through chapter 3, verse 6. And if you remember, chapter 3, verse 6, uh, sorry, in 3, verse 5, it says, after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he, he, he says to the man, stretch out your hands, he heals it, and then the Pharisees and Herodians go out and plan to kill him. That's the climax of hostility as far as Mark is telling the story from 2.1 to 3.6, because their hostility starts with just a quietness of their heart, and then it becomes spoken, and then it becomes confrontation, and it, it couched as, as honest questions, and then just flat out crit criticism of his ministry. And the hostility continues to increase from 2.1 through 3.6. When you get to chapter 3, verse 22, he goes back to the religious leaders. And you might be, if you're paying attention to the story at this point, you might be thinking, well, what, what purpose does that serve? Because you've already documented the unbelief of the religious leaders, and that's exactly the point. He's actually not adding to what he already did as if, as if he messed up and he just forgot that story. This story is told to contrast the response of the religious leaders with the hometown crowd namely his biological family from Nazareth. This is an incredibly, incredibly instructive because neither the response of the religious leaders, as we've already seen, is a saving response, but neither is it, even when you contrast it and compare it to a better response, namely a response that's that's saturated in familial loyalty and a desire to see it go well for Jesus Christ. This is the response of his biological family, and it is also insufficient. Their response is described in verse 20 and 21, and then it picks back up in verse 31 all the way through verse 33. And as I, as, I, as I made an outline for you, I really only have one, one slide because I just wanted to put the whole outline of this entire narrative for you in front of you. Because of what Mark does, he starts the story, he inserts another story, he goes back to the story, and then he concludes the story. And so I wanted you to be able to see what he's doing all in one slide right there. And so as I'm asking the question that Mark is asking, are you in Christ's family? We need to pay attention to the responses of these, of these characters as the story unfolds. The first point is from 22 to 30, we see in the, in the middle of this little sandwich here, the guts of it is the religious leaders, namely the scribes. They're saying he's satanic. 
how would they answer the question? They would say, no, he's a liar. No, he's satanic. No, he's doing what he's doing by the power of Satan himself. So we're going to start right there, and then we'll go back and pick up 20 and 21. In verse 22, it's important to notice that it's the scribes. I mean, Mark has already talked about the Pharisees. In fact, in chapter, we saw it in chapter 3, verse 6, the Pharisees and the Herodians. I mean, this is a religious sect and a political sect. They are united against Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 22, he uses a technical term, scribes, and that's literally somebody who's versed in letters. And that's not talking about some sort of literary poet or literary critic. It's talking about an expert in the letters of the, of the word, the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Torah, the writings, and the prophets. It's an expert in the scriptures, a Jewish scribe. I mean, these are the guys who know their Bibles. If anyone knows their Bibles, it's the scribes. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem, they're coming, and they're coming down by way of elevation up, if you're looking on a north-pointing map. They're coming from Jerusalem up to the Sea of Galilee where Jesus is ministering. As verse 20 says, he, he came home, probably to Simon Peter's house, uh, and so that's on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And so they come up from Jerusalem, they came down from Jerusalem by way of elevation, and they're saying he is possessed by Beelzebul. Now this is a profound statement, a profound attack. The word Beelzebul is a word that goes all the way back to the Philistines, specifically to the town of Ekron. Um, in Ekron, they worshipped Beelzebul, and it's a, it's a combination of the word Baal, uh, which just means Lord, and that's, that's a god of the Philistines. It's a Philistine god, a Canaanite god. And um, the word Zebul, which just means high place, and it can mean Lord of the high places. Uh, you know, if you worshiped Baal on the high places, that would be Baal Zebul, Zebub, uh, or sorry, Baal Zebul, or Baal Prince. So Baal is the prince, or the Lord is the prince. He is high, he is exalted. Let me show you uh, a, a variant here that shows up in 2 Kings chapter 1. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 1, we see where we're introduced to this word properly at, at Ekron. Four times in this chapter, we see the word Baal um, Zebub in verse 2, in verse 3, in verse 6, and in verse 16. It's interesting, every single time that the word, the name Baal Zebub is used, it's described as the God of Ekron. Notice that in verse 2. Go inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron, whether I will recover from this sickness. Verse 3. Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Verse 6, um, the, thus says the Lord, is it because there's no God of Israel that you're sending to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? And then again in verse 16, is it because there's no God in Israel to inquire of his word? And it says, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron. Every single time, this is clearly the God of the Canaanites, of the Philistines, specifically in the town of Ekron. And it's interesting here, it's not Baal Zebul, but Baal Zebub. And Zebub is the Hebrew word for flies. The Lord of the flies. It's been talked about this last Sunday night, the Lord of the flies. And uh, you know where that came from. Well, it came from, right here it is in the, in the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, the, 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 the Lord of the flies. And so is Ecclesiastes 10.1 even uses this word, when Solomon says, dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink, it's just the Hebrew word for flies, zebub. And this is probably a deliberate slam on Baal. It's not surprising that in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in 2 Kings 1, every single time it's um, Baal uh, zebub, and it's transliterated, and, and uh, I'm sorry, it's Baal muon, which is the Greek word, Lord of the Flies. And in Greek, um, they have an idiom, and you can see that they use the word flies. Their, their regard for flies is just directly corollary to our regard for flies. They have an idiom in Greek, to make an elephant out of flies. And that's equivalent to, to make a mountain out of a molehill. Uh, in the Greek language, if somebody shows up for dinner uninvited, they might call them a fly. It's kind of a nuisance. They just show up everywhere. Here we are, get the fruit out, and there's a fly. Of course, flies are attracted to what stinks, like dung, and that probably has something to do with even how this word came to be a mockery of Baal, lord of the dung or excrement. 
This significance uh, seems to be lost on a lot of uh, first century Jews, especially secular Jews. But regardless of what the secular Jews would have thought, the scribes knew its significance. They knew exactly what they were saying in verse 22 when they say of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is possessed by Beelzebul. And he cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. And then, of course, Zebul is the one, Baal, the high one, or Baal on the high places, or Baal, the prince. And that certainly is what's, what's um, echoed in that second phrase. He cast out demons by the ruler of demons. They are ascribing Jesus' ministry to satanic power. They are saying that the way he pulls off these incredible miracles and the way that he has such a following is due to Satan's influence. This is really the first, the first charge. You can see that I have there these three responses that you need to consider. Uh, he's, he's satanic, he's not sane, he is savior. Uh, you could, that could parallel the, uh, the famous uh, uh, triad, um, uh, liar, lunatic, or Lord. You've probably heard those three uh, descriptions of Jesus Christ, um, and it's true. Uh, either if you read the scriptures and you look at what he says about himself, you're really, it's inescapable. Any one of those three are, are, would have to be a conclusion you would come to. You, you, there's, not another, there's not another alternative. Their response is, He's a liar, and not just a liar because he's not a truth teller. They're saying he's a liar because he claims to be Messiah, but he's satanic. His ministry is demonic. That's the charge. Verse 23, he calls them to himself, and he began speaking to them in parables. And this becomes quite common. He begins speaking to uh, the people in parables because of their unbelief. Here he's speaking to the religious leaders in parables because of their unbelief. He's going to do it to the people in chapter 4, verse 2. He was teaching them many things in parables. And uh, the reason why he speaks in parables, as we'll find out in chapter 4, is to conceal truth. Parables weren't just a good choice for illustration. Parables actually concealed truth. It was a judicial response of Christ in response to unbelief if he just wanted to make a word picture, if he just wanted to illustrate, he would just make an illustration and then explain it. Parables did not come with, illust with, with explanation. And that's what exactly what happens in chapter 4. He gives these parables, and anybody who would want to know truth more would go to him to find the meaning. They, they would realize, there's something here that I'm missing. And they would go to Christ to get fuller explanation. What's interesting here is he tells a parable, and the parable, in this case requires familiarity with the Old Testament, which the scribes certainly had. This is interesting. Verse 23. He called them to himself and began speaking in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? I mean, this is absurd. He just points out to the sheer uh, lunacy of thinking that Satan is going to be opposed to himself. Satan's fighting himself. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan then has risen up against himself and is divided, he can't stand. Instead, he's finished. It's over. Kingdom of darkness is done. And so, surprised if any of you didn't realize, no, Jesus is not quoting Abraham Lincoln. He predates Lincoln by quite a ways. But he is pointing out the, the sheer impossibility of the kingdom of darkness being opposed to itself. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come to earth and he is absolutely overturning and showing dominance over Satan and all the kingdom forces of the dark, of the dark world. This is Satan himself, who Paul says in Ephesians 2, 2, is the prince of the power of the air. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, is he's the god of this world. He's the one who's been given a delegated authority over a cursed earth. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has become man, and now, as man, is overturning the power, authority, and the effects of Satan's dominion over this sin-cursed earth. This is profound. And he's just pointing out the absurdity of that being done by Satan in verses 23 to 27. That's impossible. 
That's the summary of verse 23 to 27. I'm oh, sorry, 23 to 26. Now in verse 27, there's a contrast. But, and this becomes so, so important, verse 27, but no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Now that's an interesting parable. The picture is a strong man, you know, somebody who has a lot of power, a lot of strength, they're mighty. Maybe this is somebody you picture, you know, some sort of muscle-bound uh, gym rat, and he's just got all sorts of power, and he's just super strong, and it's like, what could we possibly do against this guy? He's pointing out no one could possibly go rip the guy off, steal from his own house, unless, he, unless he's bound. You'd have to bind that guy first. But there's, there's more than just meets the eye. This is actually language that is very familiar to the prophet that Mark started his gospel with. Remember Mark chapter one? He starts out by saying, look, I'm gonna write to you the biography of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then he begins with quoting from Isaiah chapter 40. And Isaiah chapter 40, and, all, and from really from 40 to 66, is one of the most incredible portions of messianic prophecy in all of the Old Testament scripture. And let's go back to Isaiah for a second, and let me show you what Jesus is doing with this analogy, or better, a parable of the strong man. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. And our verse really is in verse 17, but it won't really serve us as good as, it, as, as well as it should if we skip the context. So what I want to do is I, I want to go back to four, chapter 43, verse 14, and then we're just going to read this little stanza here. So let's pick it up in verse 14. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and will bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans, into the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters. And again, as we looked at in the very introduction, Isaiah 40 to 48 is just full of these references of God coming to earth and making a path, making a way, making straight the way of the Lord. And that's what Mark does, is he just starts documenting all of the people who are following him on the way, which is not many, but he's, Christ has come to earth and he's paving a way. And here he's just, it's a way of redemption for the people of God. Verse 17, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty man, they will lie down together and not rise again. They have been quenched and extinguished like a wick. And pause right there. What's the, the picture here? I mean, the picture is obviously of Egypt. And you go back to Egypt and the, the Exodus. God brings the people of God out of Egypt, and they get pinned up against the, uh, the Red Sea. And there's the Egyptian military bearing down on them. And that's what's being pictured here is the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty man. But he's not speaking about Egypt. That's historical referent. Who is he speaking about? Isaiah is speaking about Babylon, the current world superpower that is bringing them into captivity. Verse 18, do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? In other words, don't compare what I'm about to do to deliver the nation from all pagan enemies and from all Gentile dominance. I will fulfill, fulfill the seed promise in such a fashion that you shouldn't even compare it to the Exodus. When I show forth my hand and fulfill my promises of fulfilling the seed promise, Israel, watch out. You won't even dare make the poor comparison of Egypt. It won't even stand up to comparison. Every Jew will be aware of it. All mankind will be aware of it. Here's what I'll do. I will even make a roadway. Again, the same word, Derek. A roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I've given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. The people whom I formed for myself will declare my praise. He's talking about a future deliverance Fulfillment of the seed promise that's going to be marked by an entire generation worshiping Yahweh. 
for deliverance, for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, and for restoration and fulfillment of all the promises in the Old Testament. Let me give you one more. Skip over to chapter 40, 49. Isaiah 49. So in chapter 43, verse 17, we see that God has promised to just absolutely manhandle the mighty man. And here's one more. Isaiah 49 and we're going to, our, our proper passage is 24 to 26. But again, let me give you a little bit of context. I don't, this one kind of requires a little bit more, but I don't want to read everything just for the sake of time. I would love to read all of 49. Let's just pick it up in chapter 49, verse 14. Verses 14 and 15, Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and the Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. As Zion is being personified here as just recognizing we've been forsaken, fulfillment hasn't happened, where's the Lord who promised all of this fulfillment? God says, look, a nursing mother won't even forget her child, and even if that were to happen in some unique scenario, even these may forget, but I will not forget you. This is talking about his commitment to save them and to bring a Messiah, and so... Let's skip down to um, verse 19. Oh, let's skip down to verse 18. We'll pick it up in verse 18. Lift up your eyes and look around. All of them gather together. They come to you. Who is this? This is all the inhabitants, all of the enemies, all of those who are um, uh, just trying to destroy Israel. Look around. They're all gathering together. They come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you will surely put on all of them as jewels and bind them on as a bride for your waste and desolate places and your destroyed land. Surely now you will be too cramped for the inhabitants, and those who swallowed you will be far away. In other words, so many people are converting to worship Yahweh in the nation of Israel that it's, it's, it's just, it can't even hold all of those who will worship Yahweh in this day. Verse 20, the children of whom you were bereaved will yet say in your ears, the place is too cramped for me. Make room for me that I may live here. And so it's an interesting wordplay that there's children of whom they were bereaved. In other words, naturally, you might have even lost children, but now God is bringing children who are children of God, brothers of the Israelites, because they are all worshiping Yahweh. Then you will say in your heart, who has begotten these for me? Since I have been bereaved of my children, and I'm barren, and an and, and exile, and, and a wanderer. Who has reared these? Behold, I was left alone. From where did these come from? Of course, these are converts from God. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hands to the nations. I will set up my standard to the peoples. And they will bring your sons in their bosom. And your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. I mean, these are called sons and daughters of the people of God coming from pagan lands. Verse 23, Kings will be your guardians and their princes, your nurses, Princesses will be your nurses, and they will bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick the dust of your feet, and you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hopefully wait for me will not be put to shame. Now listen to verse 24 and 20 to 26. Can the prey be taken from the mighty man? Or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? Surely, thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty man will be taken away, and the prey of the tyrant will be rescued. For I will contend with the one who contends with you, and I will save your sons. I will feed your oppressors their own flesh, and they will become drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh will know that I, Yahweh, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob." Look, when God comes to earth, watch out. He's going to make it obvious that he has all rule and all dominion in human seed form. And in verse 25, Yahweh is even using terms of himself that, that correlate with the angel of the Lord in that he will contend with those who contend with you and I will save your sons. This is talking about salvation and protection of the people of God and the fulfillment of the seed promise. Who could possibly come to earth and plunder what is Satan's unless he first binds Satan 
unless he shows superior power, superior authority, superior might. And here comes a man from Nazareth, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And he is binding Satan, saving those who are sons and daughters. And go back to Mark chapter 3. Now hopefully the parable makes sense. And that's important that we took a little bit of detour to understand the parable properly because that'll help us in one of the one of the most troublesome passages in all of the Gospel of Mark, which is coming up here at the very end. Look at what Jesus says. Verse 28, truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whoever blas- and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And this gets into the discussion of, a, of the unpardonable sin. There certainly is, in verse 29, an unpardonable sin, and there certainly is, in verse 28, pardonable blasphemies. This is really, really important. I don't want anybody to be confused by this because certainly people have been troubled by that and people have, I've been asked that question, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. I've even studied under theologians who would say, well, you can't commit the unpardonable sin because it could have only happened in Jesus' earthly ministry. And we need to look at this. In verse 28, Jesus clearly says, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, whatever blasphemies they utter. I mean, what he's including there is you could even blaspheme Christ as an unbeliever, and as we'll find out, from a position of ignorance, ignorance of the word of God, ignorance of truth, ignorance of what the Spirit has written in the scriptures about Jesus Christ. I mean, how many people in this room have probably cursed the sweet name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, before they were converted? And now you are walking with, in humility, with forgiveness of sins, having been restored to the God that you formerly offended. Whatever blasphemies, as much as could be uttered, will be forgiven. But the contrast comes in verse 29, and the contrast comes here when it says, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, what's happening here? Well, we can, first of all, we can be encouraged by the words of Ryle, who gives some very sound advice as we begin thinking about what Jesus is saying in verse 29. There is such a thing as a sin which will never be forgiven, but those who are troubled about it are most unlikely to have committed it. And so when somebody comes to me and they're burdened, I think I've committed this sin that's unpardonable. Well, the fact that you're burdened by something is not a good sign that it's unpardonable because that's probably a good sign. There's a softness, there's a burden, there's a grief. I think I might have done something that displeases the Lord. If you truly had committed the, the unpardonable sin, you would not be concerned about this verse, let alone if the Lord Jesus Christ was personally directing it to you as he was to these scribes. But what is it, though? I was very encouraged by the answer that I found in, from, I'm going to appeal to John Calvin here, and this is his words as he described this reality, and he's looking at all the parallels in the synoptic gospels discussing that, this very, par- this very story, including Mark 3. He said, I say, therefore, that they sin against the Holy Spirit who, with evil intention, resist God's truth although by its brightness they are so touched that they cannot claim ignorance. Such resistance alone constitutes this sin. For Christ, to explain what he had said, immediately adds, he who speaks against the Son of Man will have his sin forgiven, but he who blasphemes against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And that's from the gospel, that's the parallel in in Matthew, in Matthew's gospel. The issue here is not that somebody called Jesus demonic on its, on its own. The issue here is, number one, we're talking about scribes, the experts in the Old Testament. When he tells the parable of the strong man, you better believe they knew Isaiah 43. They knew Isaiah 49. They're watching him fulfill the very scriptures. They study. They know this is what God said through his spirit, as his spirit wrote the Old Testament scriptures, this is exactly what would happen. And Christ is fulfilling it in front of their eyes. 
The issue here is that they knew Old Testament prophecy. They knew what the Holy Spirit has testified to in the scripture, and they watch it fulfilled in Christ's person, and then they blaspheme against that. This is not the curse against Christ of, a, of somebody who didn't even know what the strong man was. Never studied the prophecy of Isaiah. This is the blasphemy of somebody who has studied the word and familiar with the word and rejects it. Have you blasphemed Christ? Even that is forgivable. But the issue here is a willful, deliberate sinning against what the Spirit has written and calling the fulfillment of truth satanic and demonic. And that's what these scribes are guilty of. We read that, we read this story, it is just terrifying to consider that somebody would get here, and people do, but even most agnostics and even most atheists don't even get here. This is a foil, this is a contrast. It's a contrast to a more subtle form of unbelief, and that is the the smug and complacent response of Jesus' biological family. And this is the response of the family. They, they say that he's, he's not sane. They're saying that he's, he's a lunatic. He's, he, the, the issue here is, if you asked his biological family, are you his family, they would say, well, of course we're his family. It's just that he's gone a little too far. That's the response of the family. And this becomes... a much more helpful instruction for, for us because I don't imagine that any of you walked in here this morning, you probably wouldn't have come this morning if you were in verses 22 to 30. And in fact, the way Mark tells the story, this is not even his story. He's just giving that as background to make sense of verses 20 and 21 and verses 31 to 35. And so here's, the, here's a really nuanced response that has, a, has an appearance of loyalty. It has an appearance of affinity. It has an appearance of authenticity. It has an appearance of saying, I want what's best for Christ. I care about Christ. And his family is watching what's happening, and they're saying, I think he's just gone a little too far. Look at verse 20. He came home, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. I mean, we're talking about such a level of popularity that they couldn't even get a meal it's so crowded, it's so jam-packed, there's not enough time, there's not enough space, there's not enough room. It is so busy and hectic and frenetic, they don't even have time, they can't even, you can put it on the day planner, it just gets overrun by the demands and the needs, the teaching needs, the, the healings, the, 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 the demoniacs and sickness and everything else that's coming at him, and he just keeps teaching the truth and meeting the needs of these, these people who are, who are sheep without a shepherd. So verse 21, his people hear of this, and his own people is a phrase that could mean you know, kind of just people who are, you know, grew up around him, like the Nazareth hometown crowd, or it could mean his biological family. I'll, I won't belabor it, but just simply to say, if you look at Mac, Mark chapter 6, verse 2, um, Mark certainly has the ability to talk about Nazareth and to talk about um, those who are, um, uh, that's not the reference. There it is, or, sorry, verse 1. Uh, Mark 6, verse 1. When he went out from there, he came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him, and he began teaching in the synagogue, verse 2, with many listeners, and they were astonished, saying, where did, he, where did he get these things? And so they know him. This is the hometown crowd. They're appealing to the fact that they know his father, his mother, his brothers, in verse 3, and they took offense at him. That's the hometown crowd. That's just Nazareth, just secular Nazareth. Here, this phrase, those who are his own, those who are near to him, it's literally would be, a good, a good translation would be, um, his kinsmen, and that becomes clearly the issue in verse 31. It's his mother and his brothers, and he even appeals to his sisters in verse um, 35. And so in verse 21, when his own people, this is his biological family, when they heard of this, they went out to take custody of him. They were going to grab him, apprehend Jesus Christ, because why? That says in verse 21b, for they were saying he's lost his senses. He's gone off, his, off the rails. He's just He's not thinking soundly. This is crazy. He's got such an amount of following. He's such a high-profile figure. If we don't intervene and we aren't loyal to Christ, who's going to help him? Because he's going to get himself in some serious trouble. I mean, of course, in our day and age, you would just put him in an insane asylum. You would, you would medicate for this. In this day and age, you're going to get executed because you're drawing way too much attention to yourself. So, verse 31. Then his mother... And his brothers arrived. 
And standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. And a crowd sitting around him, they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Twice in two verses, he uses the word outside. It's interesting, by the time you get down to the parables in chapter 4, Jesus starts to explain them when he's alone with his disciples in verse 10. And in verse 11, he was saying to them, To you it has been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, they get everything in parables. The disciples are in. There are people on the out who only get the concealed version because they are not believing. This is a pretty, pretty grim picture of the biological family. It's pretty impossible to even deal with this text for those in the Roman Catholic Church who have since, since Pope Pius IX have said that Mary was sinless. Here she is sinning. And I believe she's already a believer. We see that in Luke 2. She's already acknowledged that God, the Lord, is her Savior. She's already acknowledged her sin in the Magnificat, Luke chapter 2. Um, she is trusting in the promises of God generally, but here we are, we're seeing her at a low point, a moment of unbelief. His brothers aren't believing him at all at this point, and we, we know that from John chapter 7. This is his biological family, either in the, with the brothers in the state of unbelief or with his mother in a moment of unbelief. And they're outside, They're on the outs because of their unbelief. But they are loyal to Christ. They know what's best for Christ. They are friends of Christ. If you ask them, are you in Christ's family? They would say, of course. I'm a huge fan. Love the guy. Know him. him, Knew him since birth. I'm his sibling, by the way. But I'll tell you what. Kind of popularity he's gotten in his most recent days, just a little too much. A little crazy, a little over the top. I think he's lost his senses. Good thing he's got a brother like me to come along and help him balance out his, his train wreck ministry. So I'm going to just grab him, and I'll lock him up in handcuffs, and we'll drag him back to Nazareth if we have to. But we are going to protect him from the kind of trouble he's going to get himself into. And they're outside. Verse 33, Jesus asked this question. He said, who are my mother and my brothers? It's hard to to read that, to think about if you were his mother and his brothers. Of course, this is not a moment of amnesia. I mean, he knows who they are. This is a very pertinent question. The question we have to answer this morning, who are Christ's family Are we Christ's family? Are you Christ's family? That's the question that Jesus is asking, and that's the point that Mark is highlighting. Are you in Christ's family? Who is his family? Think about where we're at. Before we get to verse 34 and 35, think about where we're at in the Gospel of Mark. Go back a couple of weeks, and remember from Mark chapter 3, verse 7 to 12, and we saw here, uh, the beginning of, of the unbelief of the people, and we saw these two inadequate responses to Christ, and we saw the, the fanaticism, the fervor, the frenzy. The, the, the people were just pursuing him. They, they're self-loving, and they're curious, and they're just self-seeking, and there's entertainment value to be had by getting near Christ and being around Christ, and so they fall upon Christ in order to touch him because they're driven by self-love. Meanwhile, the demons are contrasting the people. The demons are falling before him out of fear because they recognize who he is. They at least know his identity. And they at least recognize his authority to damn them in hell forever. That's an even better response than the people of verses 7 to 10, and it's still insufficient. And then last week we saw the the calling of the 12. Jesus chose the 12. Literally, he makes 12 in the original and he had, we saw the purpose of that was so that they would be with him and that he could send them out. And that's the purpose of the 12. And we saw there a list of ragtag, disunified group of men, just a bunch of nobodies. 
I mean, he is, Mark has been documenting the, the, the unbelief of the religious leaders for two chapters. And how many religious leaders were selected for the 12? Zero. How many were nobility? Zero. He chose a ragtag group of misfits, totally disunified. In fact, former opponents of one another in the case of Levi the tax collector and Simon the zealot, opposite sides of the social spectrum with potentially fatal animosity. And that's his group. Those are his guys. Think about where we're at. Think about who's on the inside and who's on the outside, who's in Christ's family and who's not. Christ chose the 12. And here, his own family, who imagines they are loyal. And if you asked his biological family, do you care about Christ? They would have said, yes. Are you close to Christ? Yes. Do you have a familial relationship with Christ? They would have said, yes. And none of those questions and none of those answers are sufficient enough. Christ Christ chose the 12. I want to share an anecdote that I was appreciating as I was thinking about this, the 12 and as I was thinking about the populace of the people in verses 7 to 10 and as I was thinking about the biological family in 31 to 33. Uh, I'm currently reading a biography by, on G.M. Trevelyan, who was one of the foremost historians in Britain. He, um, he heard the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preach when Mo Martin Lloyd-Jones preached at Trinity College in Cambridge just right after World War II Trevelyan came up to Lloyd-Jones and said to him, Sir, it has been given to you to speak with great power. He was impressed by his sermon, and one of, his, one of Trevelyan's fellow scholars said, Man, if that guy keeps hearing Lloyd-Jones any longer, he's going to be converted. And as I'm reading this biography of, of George Macaulay Trevelyan, it's very clear that he's one of those individuals in the history of mankind, who just stand out. They stand out because of their nobility. They stand out because of what they were handed by way of privilege. They stand out by way of intellect. And they stand out by way of accomplishment. They stand out by who they are in society. He was related to the most famous historian of the previous century, Thomas McCullough. He was related to the Wilberforces, the Darwins, the Keynes's, the Haldanes, he belonged to two aristocracies, the aristocracy of pr privileged birth and the aristocracy of privileged talent. He was, uh, they comes from a family of remarkable ability. His brother served on parliament. He served in World War I, despite defective eyesight, actually made his way to the front lines in Italy. He became the Regis Chair of Modern History at Cambridge. He was the Master of Trinity College in Cambridge. He earned 13 honorary doctorates from universities in Britain, America, and Europe. But, in spite of his appreciation for broad-minded and tolerant Anglicans, he remained an agnostic through his whole life. And he recognized that many disadvantaged people, <laughs> I feel like he's looking at me, those people, those disadvantaged people, who found a great comfort in their faith, and he said, I sympathize with their desire for the old religions, though not needing them myself. At the end of his life, Martin Lloyd-Jones read a review of a biography of Trevelyan, and he said, it turned out to be a tremendous blessing to me. What would have been a tremendous blessing after reading about a life of a man who was so noble, so dignified, so accomplished, so renowned, the best-selling historian of the first half of the 20th century in Britain, what could have blessed him if this man did not trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of his sins? It turned out to be a tremendous blessing to me, Lloyd-Jones said. Here in Trevelyan is human nature at its best. And it came to me with such force. Why did God ever choose to look on me? Why me in contrast with this man and the despair in which he died? Lloyd-Jones was blown away that he would be on the inside and Trevelyan would be on the outside. The question that I'm asking you this morning is, are you in Christ's family? 
Of course, if you were to compare yourself to some hardened, um, blaspheming atheist who believed that Jesus was satanic because they'd studied the scriptures cover to cover, of course, that might be the verse 22 to 30 kind of category. But for you who are even coming from a posture of loyalty or even friendly, a friendly um, attitude toward Christ, the question is not, do you have a relationship with Christ? The question is, are you his family? Do you assume that your relationship with Christ is good, or is it proven? Sometimes we might stop short of verse 34 and 35, and we might just assume that our relationship with Christ is good, and we assume that due to knowledge, which is not enough. Even the scribes in verse 22 to 30 had knowledge. They knew about the strong man, Isaiah 43 and 49. They knew what it was going to be like for the seed to show up on earth and, and bind Gentile powers. They knew the future, and they did not believe in Christ. Sometimes we assume on our relationship with Christ due to comfortability in the church. We're comfortable. We know how to fit in. We got our social circle. We know where to go on Sunday morning, where to go in small group. We know the conversations to have. We know how to respond to the questions we're asked. I've known individuals get radically saved, brought in a supernatural way into the people of God. They're members of Christ's family, and they feel so out of place because they just feel like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a miscue. I'm going to step where I'm not supposed to step, and it's going to be disastrous. And everybody kind of knows the code, and I don't, I don't know what to say. And you get to say to that person, man, welcome to the family. Like, who you are, you should be here as you are. And they got some sort of dark background, criminal past, and they think, oh, there's no way I'm ever going to fit into this group. Everybody knows what's going on. They know how to, you know, drink their tea with their pinky out and so on and so forth. Sometimes we assume that our relationship with Christ is, is good because we're comfortable in the church. Meanwhile, there are people who are also so comfortable in the church, but they, they know all those things, the right posture, the right demeanor, the right answers. They might give financially. They might serve regularly. They avoid indicting behaviors that would expose them. So anything that would cause them to be looked on, down upon by their, their friends inside the church, but when it comes right down to bosom idols, they're not about to give it up. This could be the person who refuses to lead their wife just simply because Christ does not rule his heart. Self-love does. And their conscience might be saying, peace at all costs, and they would never do anything that would stir up anything in the church. But their theological reality is that he's never bowed the knee to Christ. Christ isn't ruling his life. And he might be comfortable in a social setting of the church, but the better question is, does he do God's will? We might assume that our relationship with God is good because of comparison. Think about how the family would have fared if they compared themselves to the scribes of 22 to 30. The family comes along and they have a posture of loyalty and help. And so when we as, as Christians examine ourselves and we compare ourselves to the people outside the church, we might think, see, of course I have a good relationship with Christ. What's the test? How could we possibly know if we're really in Christ's family? Jesus gives us the answer in verse 34 and 35. Looking about at those who were around him, he says, behold, my mother and my brothers. And we should acknowledge right here in verse 34 and, uh, that it's, it's clear that his family is seated at his feet, hearing his words. But even that is not enough. Because the explanation goes beyond hearing to doing. Verse 35, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. The question isn't what you know. The question isn't what you've heard. The question is what you do. And of course, the question is not perfection, but the question had better be, Am I doing God's will? Is my life characterized by 
conformity to God's will. And when I don't conform to God's will, grief and mourning and repentance because I want to get into God's will. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, Jesus said that the last day in judgment, people are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? And there's all sorts of activity, all sorts of action, including casting out demons and prophesying, all sorts of function, and the response is not, those weren't legitimate. The response is simply, apart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. Are you in Christ's family? Judgment is not according to what you hear, it's not according to what you know, it's according to what you do. Romans chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. 2 Timothy 3, 5. The church is going to be increasingly characterized by people who, who have a form of godliness but deny its power. They have an external veneer of Christianity but they don't have power to overcome sin in their inner man. James chapter 1, verses 21 to 25, warns about becoming mere hearers, but instead be doers, lest we delude ourselves. We can get so complacent, friends, hearing God's word, doing the routine, week in and week out, and the question is going to come, are we Christ's family? We have got to ask and examine, do we actually do God's will? Father, I thank you for this text, and thank you for this story, and I pray that it would give us clarity an insight to the state of our own soul. There's no question, Lord, that could be more important than this question. Are we in your family? Are we your children? Are we Christ's brothers and sisters? Lord, if there are any here, and I'm sure that there are in a room this size, any here who are not your family, and perhaps they might have a long track record of, of loyalty and a posture of friendliness toward you, but maybe for years in, in some very significant but private ways, maybe they've been balancing your words, correcting where you overspeak, imagining that you've gone too far and they've been living a, a safe, comfortable external Christianity. But perhaps, Lord, their, their heart is not characterized by doing your will. Lord, may not today be the day of salvation. May not your spirit grant supernatural life. Lord, our desire is that we would see our heart the way you see us. That we'd be able to find assurance to the answer to this question simply from this text. And that we would not answer this question about whether we're in your family by any other criteria than whether we do your will. So give us clarity from your word, we pray. Amen.